This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly supported by my music staff. Sibelius would write really low in the winds, and you look up, is that really going to work, you know? And then you listen to the recording and go, wow, it, it, it does, you know, in a way that Beethoven didn't do, and, and uh, that's what's in- interesting to me. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Good day, everyone, and welcome back to Season 2, 2018 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to Episode number 125, and a very special welcome to all my Inner Circle Piano Teaching community members. It has been absolutely wonderful to meet so many of you and hear such great things about the podcast at recent events, um, including MTNA in Florida uh, and a variety of workshops uh, both here around Australia and overseas too. It's just been phenomenal. I am so glad that it's having such a great impact on you and I am pleased as well that you seem to be enjoying the seasons too, although I've had a few people say, I really miss hearing you every week, um, but I've, I've certainly been enjoying putting together some discrete seasons for you this year and uh, so far, so good. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show, and if this is your first time here, thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope that you enjoy the content and tell all your piano teaching friends about it. And for those of you who have been tuning in for a while, thanks again for choosing to spend time with me. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is your place for inspiration, ideas, business, and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and grow your studio. And the best way to listen to these podcasts is via my piano teaching app, Just search for Tim Topham in your favorite app store. Today's show notes and a full transcript are now available at timtopham.com slash episode 125. I thought that it would be fun to kick off season two of the podcast with another of my composer spotlights, which feature conversations with some of your most cherished composers and arrangers, delving into their background, teaching and thoughts on creativity and composition. Last season's discussion in episode 118 with Kevin Olsen was one of the most popular episodes in that season. So today, we're continuing the tradition with another very well-known artist. Before I introduce today's composer, remember that you can access my previous interviews, including the likes of Carol Matz, Dennis Alexander, Pamela Wedgwood, and Irina Gorin, to name just a few, by downloading my app for Apple, Google, or Android devices, or searching at timtopham.com slash podcast. My guest today is a prolific arranger, orchestrator, and producer. His work is featured in numerous instrumental recordings, church, choral, and educational piano music. He is also co-author, major composer, and orchestrator of the internationally acclaimed Hal Leonard Student Piano Library. He holds a Bachelor of Music in Composition from California State University and a Master of Music in Composition from the University of Southern California. It is, of course, the fantastic Philip Keverin. Welcome to the show, Philip. Nice to meet you, Tim. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you. And I actually can't believe that I'm able to spend some time with you given all the music that you seem to put out all the time. I'm going to ask (laughs) you a little bit later on how on earth it's possible for you to create so much music. But before we go into that, um, can you give all our listeners a bit of a a sneak peek into a a week in the life of uh, Philip Keverin? What, What kinds of things do you mainly do? Uh, I have a home studio uh, where I where I write the, write piano music, but I'm also writing orchestrations for studio work here. And so uh, any day, a lot of my days start with writing around. Uh, I, I'm an early riser, so I'm down here by six thirty, six or six thirty in the morning, and then recording sessions almost always start at ten. So I'll go in and do a ten to a one, and sometimes a two to a five, depending on the day. So morning is when I get my uh, my piano writing done. Right, and when you say recording, what what are you uh, recording? Well, I'm an orchestrator. About ha- about half my life is spent. Uh, well, I don't know how you would divide it out, but maybe a, a third of my my time is spent doing uh, piano arrangements, and then I work in commercial industry. It might be a documentary film score or a 
an artist that's doing a recording here in Nashville, it needs an orchestra, that, that type of thing. Right. And do you have a home uh, studio for that? I, I don't record an orchestra here, but I do all my uh, pre-production here, you know, MIDI programming and all the things you need to go in and work with the orchestra. Right. Okay. And then, and then so you'll, you'll actually sit at a computer and use Logic or whatever it is to come up with the content and then you'll output scores, which you'll eventually go and record with a live orchestra, hopefully. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> one yeah, of the one of the, right. one of the most expensive course, things. <laughs> well, yeah, and of course, depending on the budget of the project, sometimes you know part of part of the production will use what I've programmed as well, or or a mixture thereof. You know. Yeah, I, I'm I'm often amazed at just how amazing the quality is now of so many of those samples that you can get in in this software. It's it's almost uh, hard to tell the difference sometimes. Sometimes it is. It, it really comes down to the space that surrounds it. You know, it's like the room that you record in could make the difference. I will always prefer a live orchestra any day. But <laughs> any before, composer would say that. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, young producers, a lot of times, they don't care. They're, they're fine with the samples. Right. Yeah. Um, and now, have you got any notable films or documentaries that our, our listeners might have seen or heard of that you've worked on in the last few years? One of the things I'm really was pleased with the way it turned out was there's a show called um, Saving Augusta that is on Netflix right now. Right. Um, that was a great experience. That's one of something that's floating out there currently. Okay. And that it was that a, is that a, a TV? multi-part series drama sort of yeah, thing it's, it's a two-hour documentary about a, it's a world war ii story all uh, right um, and uh very very interesting story we could spend a we could spend this whole thing on that documentary <laughs> really really interesting story if, if we get time i'd love to come back to uh the inspiration for composing and where it all starts um but okay. uh let's let's just go on to um Oh, actually, quick question. Do you do any teaching or have you taught piano in the past? I certainly have, and I've kept my hand in that over the years. I'll usually have anywhere from uh, two to three people that I'm trying to stay current with. Right. It's very hard to do both. It has to be somebody. It's usually somebody that's interested in composition, you know, that wants to do that specifically in addition to piano. But, yes, I have taught through the years as well. Right. And I think that sh that comes through in a lot of your arranging. The the ways that you can uh, you create your arrangements, uh, number one, very appealing. Two, uh, very playable as well. And so there's definitely that pianistic element uh, that comes through in in all that uh, that you do, or well, that I've experienced anyway. And that's probably only a very small part of your complete um, <laughs> <laughs> output. Um, so let's take you back to um, to your piano lessons and, and your childhood. Like, I want to try and find out where. Did this all begin and was it very much from you or did you have someone that really drew this composition and arranging out of you? Yeah, you know, I had very traditional experience in piano. Uh, my first teacher, Karen Shervey, was the, uh, the neighbor in the little town I grew up in. Uh, and then I had a wonderful uh, teacher in high school uh, named Fern Davidson here in, uh, in Idaho uh, in the U.S., both of these people are very classical, traditional teachers, but I was fortunate in both cases. They let me wander. You know, um, I was that miserable kid that wanted to turn something upside down, wondered why that accompaniment had to be that way. And, you know, you've had those students and, right. and it can be annoying. And I was I was very great. I, I am grateful that both both Karen and Fern would put up with with that with me right and and were they able to help you in understanding structure and form and uh progressions and things like that or did you find that somewhere else well they did but i think they pointed me in the what i would say in both cases is they pointed me toward great music and i i mean i went traditional i went to college and got a master's in composition and i had great teachers all through that process but I still say the best teacher is always the score. You know, the, all the secrets are in the music. Listen and watch scores. And I, I spend a couple hours every week still finding new works that I haven't heard before and getting the score and studying it and listening. And 
there are a lot of great teachers out there and a lot of them are dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what are you picking up from scores when you're looking at them? I, well, I've been on a Sibelius kick lately, going through the symph- uh, nine terrific symphonies. And as an orchestrator, I'm just seeing what they did to get the sound, you know? Right. What, what is the combination of that? And then absorbing form, just absorbing how f- great form happens, you know? But I would say mostly in, in recent years for me, it's just always an orchestration lesson. It's right. just Sibelius would write really low in the winds, and you look up. Oh, is that really going to work, you know? And then you listen to the recording and go, wow, it, it, it does, you know, in a way that Beethoven didn't do. And, and uh, so that's, that's what's in- interesting to me. Yeah, and, and, and I like encouraging uh, my students to, when they're listening to music, which they all do all the time, to try yeah. and uh, when they like something, to try and ask themselves why why they think they like it. What, what is it about the music? Is it the orchestration, the progression, the, the beat, yeah. the dance? What, what, what's about it to, to try and build that curiosity in students? It sounds like yeah. that's exactly what you've been doing most of your life as well. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I remember as a, as a kid listening to recording, uh, you know, I'd be next to the radio, I'd start hearing a song I like, I'd have a tape yeah. in the cassette recorder, I'd get ready when it came on. I'd press record, and then I'd listen back to it. And you'd always, you'd always get the. Yeah, I did that. Too. I'm showing my age. You'd always get the uh, the DJ talking over the start and the finish, and that really annoyed me. <laughs> but I... it was the beginning of the end for the composers, you know, collecting the royalties, right? right. <laughs> and I'd sit there, and I imagine you probably did the same. You you, you listened over and over and tried to play what you hear, and and you learn yeah. a massive oh, yeah. amount through that. Yep, I agree. Yeah. So um, can you remember what your first ever composition was? Can we take you back? You, you, it's a funny, uh, not funny, but ironic timing of that question because my parents just uh, sold the home that they that raised me in and they've been in for, over, for coming on 60 years. So they lived in the same home. And we had to absolve their estate and all these things. They're both still living, but they have moved into an assisted living thing. And, and cleaning out the house, uh, my mom found this kid scratching on a piece. It said Sonatina in G major. Oh, cute. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no memory of that whatsoever, but it's my handwriting and it's just like eight bars of. So I guess my answer is Sonatina in G major. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cute. It's not publishable but you know it's there <laughs> did you play through it again i when, did oh uh, that's that's great sounds I, a lot like uh, clementi to me right like, my end completely stolen from clementi. <laughs> there you go the inspiration's coming through um yeah exactly you've mentioned sibelius as, as someone that you've been looking at recently have you got any other big influences on your composing or arranging style oh boy uh, well Specifically for piano music or for music in general. Let's you- let's talk let's talk piano music because most listeners are piano teachers and that's the music they'll yeah. be most familiar with. I've always I, I'm a big fan of economy. Uh, I, I I love what Kabalevsky could do with just a very tight and clean. Not necessarily the, the ultimate sound. I'm not saying necessarily what I would be going for, but the cleanliness and the and the precision of that writing, I really appreciate. It. I've mm-hmm. always had a weak spot for the for the impressionistic style of music in terms of sound, and I think that bleeds through in some of my arranging. I, I can't escape. I, I love that sound. Yeah. And I've got to then ask you, how on earth? This is the question I've most been wanting to ask you since we uh, booked this. How on earth do you produce so much music? It seems that in the last five years, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's just so many more Philip Keveran books all the time coming out of these arrangements. Uh, I just can't imagine doing as much as you're doing. You must have a really great workflow or something. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I've been writing a lot of music for coming on 25 years now. Uh, it seems like there's been more in the last five years, I think, because I've certainly become more efficient in my workflow. I, I tell folks all the time, I, I mean, I write every day, minimum of three hours every day. If you do everything for a minimum three hours every day, 
you got to be a bumbling idiot not to come out with something, you know, <laughs> it's, that's a lot of time. And so I, I think it's just a matter of consistent. And I, I don't think a day goes by that I don't write, you know, I, I do take Saturday off sometimes, sometimes Sunday off. Uh, but it's not that I'm, I don't think of myself as a workaholic, but I'm a steady as she goes guy, you know, Mm. every day. And when you say writing, is that composing or arranging or could it be both? It's both. Uh, I I balance it. I mean, I have X number of books that I have to get out every year for Hal Leonard and that's primarily arranging, although some composing. Uh, When I'm working on scores, you know, for in in the commercial world, then that's, that's mostly original music. I can't do one or the other. I need variety. That's the way my brain works. You know, I, I love to compose, but I also love the challenge of taking a piece of music that shouldn't work. You know, uh, that pop piece or that whatever piece that you think, oh, I love that challenge <laughs> of, of trying to somehow make it uh, a good piano experience. Well, I put together some uh, books for the Australian Music Exam Board uh, at the end of last year and included a number, I think we've got about four of your arrangements in there. And I have to say that whenever I play them uh, to teachers, they totally love them. And I'm thinking in particular, the I don't know if you can remember this, the Goodbye Yellow Brick Road version. It's kind of lower, early advanced. Um, Mm -hmm. Fix You, Coldplay. And, uh-huh. and Seasons of Love by Rent, which I, I uh-huh. use now as a sort of a, a recital or just a piece I can pull out at any stage. Um, oh, cool. For, but- yeah, j- just so, so, so well written and, and written in different ways too. Like the uh, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road has a lot of challenging runs of demi semi quavers in batches of 10 in both right hand and left hand, whereas um, Fix You. Again, different approach, Seasons of Love, very right. different. So I'm, I'm interested right. to know... Uh, who decides one what you're going to arrange? Do publishers ask you, or do you say, "I really want to do Goodbye Yellow Brick Road"? And how do you determine how difficult an arrangement you make? Well, Hal Litter <coughs> in, in, in wants things at basically four different levels. You know, in piano solo, easy piano, what they call big note, and then real easy level, and. You know, it, it, it's a feel for me, a piano. There's a general piano solo level that all of their writers try to achieve, you know, with you know, this sort of intermediate to upper intermediate level. Uh, for me, I'm trying to write something that I can sight read fairly well. If I can't sit down and play it successfully in a sight read, then it's too hard for a high school kid to spend. You know, they're going to have to spend too long on it. Mm-hmm. So I just learned over the years kind of where that sits you know um but sometimes i mean i've just finished up a bunch of what we're calling recital suites that they're just now starting to come out that are meant to be advanced level and that was a stretch for me because i'm really writing something that i would really have to work at to perform myself and it's taken me longer to do um but did i answer the question (laughs) (laughs) I went with that. It, <laughs> yes, uh, I mean you. Are, yeah, you are. You are answering it. Uh, that, that that question of of level. So it's really um, your publisher will actually say, well, th- these are the four levels, and we need a book uh, of uh, show tunes that's big note, and you go and do that, or, or exactly. that sort of thing. Yeah. And it has evolved over the years too, from the standpoint that I don't think my easy piano is necessarily the same as maybe what their general easy piano is. Maybe. But my audience kind of knows what to expect from me in that what what has evolved, and I feel comfortable with it. But for me, it's always about you know you mentioned earlier. It, it's just even if it's advanced, it needs to fit under the hands in a way that makes it learnable in a reasonable amount of time. You know, I just do not want to spend six months learning Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Friends. You know what I mean? That, that's stretching the limit, actually, that particular arrangement, if I remember properly. That's a, on the higher end of what I would write for that Yes, level. yeah. We've put it in grade seven and it's it, it took me some practice, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, you, do you find some genres harder to arrange than others? Yes. And what are the hard and easy ones? Well, when I was younger... I would get asked a lot, oh, you've got to do a current pop collection from this year. You know, we need that from you. I finally just say, 
I, I don't want to do. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do hits from 2018 because I don't want to have to find 15 songs that are worthy of putting into a collection. There, it just doesn't. There aren't enough, frankly. And I finally, after just banging my head against the wall, maybe five or six, seven years ago, I just said, I can't, I don't want to do contemporary pop. A little more time goes by and we know what the best songs were from that time period. I'll do a collection, but. And, and the reason you know, is, because, is that because of your, your feeling about just lack of depth in the music that's coming out today? Well, yeah, and I don't want to sound like a, an old poop about that. You know, <laughs> there are, there's good stuff coming out always, you know, but not enough for a full collection in right. a year. Yeah. You know, I mean, you need three or four years to get enough stuff that has melodic material that you can make it work on the piano. Because mm. there are some very cool recordings that I love as productions, but I don't want to try to make a piano solo out of mm. it, you know. They're the hard ones when when kids want to play them as well, and they sound fantastic on the recording, and I love them. And you go, yeah. oh, look, I'm going to try and help you a little bit, but yeah. maybe this one's a better one. <laughs> yeah, ex ex exactly. It's just yeah. they they were never designed to be. That's right. A piano experience. And I, and I was very conscious when choosing popular music for this series that I just mentioned before that the pop had to have stood the test of time before I put it in because there's just no yep. point putting a 2018 hit in there probably because it just won't be in fashion in, in a couple of years. And so that yep. you have this uh, very distinct end life to, to these things you've worked so hard to put together. So I, I totally agree. Yeah. What, what about the easier ones? Is uh, I wondered whether classical might be a, quite an easy thing to arrange, or maybe that's a tricky one. Well, you know, opera themes and classical themes, that's somewhat easier because obviously it's great music. Um, I don't particularly like taking piano things and simplifying them. I very, very rarely do that. I, I just think let the piano things lay where they were originally written. But I, but I love taking, you know, orchestral themes and uh, out of the symphonic literature. And uh, my favorite, really, still to this day, I love doing folk tunes. I love doing song, these great little melodies that just give you the chance to do something almost a composition more than an arrangement because it's not, you know, there's not that much there in terms of length, but there's a great, great uh, melody, you know? Yeah. Now, a quick word from our sponsor, My Music Staff. My Music Staff is the most popular studio management software available to music teachers around the world. I've even written a blog post on how I personally used My Music Staff to transition to automatic monthly payments. All of my students now receive an automatic invoice each month and their credit cards are charged instantly. My Music Staff has become an essential part of my own studio and I've effectively been able to put my entire teaching business on autopilot. One of the great things about My Music Staff is that it scales with your studio. When you start growing your business, it doesn't mean more work for you. From student management to scheduling and billing, it offers you everything you need to manage your business with ease. There's even a student portal that allows students to notify you of any upcoming absences and even reschedule missed lessons without needing your input. It's a great solution for any teacher looking to improve their business and set themselves apart from their competition. Head to mymusicstaff.com to start your 30-day free trial today. I always ask composers and arrangers that I interview, and, and you're one of a few that I've done recently, if you have a favorite composition or arrangement that you could pull out of your how many how many of you have, do you think you've you've written or arranged in in your 25 year career? Mm, well, what would you guess? It's into the four or five hundred uh, folios, I would guess. Uh, song titles, it have you know, it's, it has to be into the thousands. Yeah. I, I don't know. Currently in print, in my series, I think there's a hundred and twenty-five or something books, something like that. Wow. Uh, okay. I think my favorite book in recent years has been a book called Classical Folk, and it basically were character pieces built around great folk songs. That one came together in a way that still pleases me. Oh, that's great. Okay, well, that's not one I'm familiar with, so we'll have to uh, pop a link in the show notes to uh, for people to be able to find that one. Is that a Hal Leonard publication? It is. Uh -huh. Great. Can you tell us how the uh, Hal Leonard uh, arrangement came about? What, what Was it a composition or arrangement in particular that allowed you to be picked up by a publisher? 
I was, my first job out of college was, I was a staff composer uh, at Yamaha. Uh, Yamaha Education Systems in the U.S. had an office in L.A., and that's where I went to college. And I, I was, I, that's where I got a crash course in pedagogy because I knew nothing about writing for pedagogical use. But I went, I was on staff there, and I learned from some great writers. And during that time, I did a pop arrangement of something that was in a Yamaha publication that somebody at Hal Leonard saw. And then I started doing non-credited arrangements of standards and things that for easy panel level. And then around 1988 or 89, somewhere around there, I did my first credited arrangements. I think the first book that maybe has my name in it, you, when you ask me that, I, I think it might be, of all things, I think it was a score. It was Dances with Wolves, film score. Oh, yeah. I Can't, remember the film. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the music, I, I think that may be the first time I did something. Right. Uh, something that a publisher had um, asked you to do. That we, yeah, a commission the, yeah. kind of thing. Right. And yeah. that would have been around 90, 1990, I guess, something like that. Right. And so are there times these days that you go uh, to to Hal and say, hey, I've just put together this box of five, uh, this book of five great things. I really think you should publish it. Or does it really always happen in the other direction? It goes both ways. Um, we're in a constant state of communication. They'll, they just sent me a note and said, what do you think about doing the who for classical piano? <laughs> okay. I said, that would be fun, you know? So I'm busy right now trying to put a song list together for that. Um, I wanted to do the recitals, Disney recital suites and, and, and Beatles. I'm doing collections of each Beatles album. So in putting them together in suites, that was an idea I pitched. Sometimes it takes forever because the, the Beatles people, the Apple Corp in London, they take forever. You know, you put it in and six or eight months later, you finally get a okay. And Disney's slow too. Mm. Um, and other times uh, they might have an exclusive on it and it's easy, you know. Um, it's kind of both ways. We just, mm. uh, we've had a long, long relationship and it's kind of a shorthand at this point between... Right. And and I, I would imagine that the copyright is all handled by Hal, but do they tend to, do you know, do they tend to wait for the approval before you start even working or do you work in the hope that you'll get approvals? Most of the time, it is already basically in the, they have an arrangement with that right. copyright holder. But there are some, for instance, Andrew Lloyd Webber, when you do a collection for a really useful music group, you have approval to arrange it, but that doesn't mean it's going to be published. It goes into their offices and somebody in there plays through them and sends you back your tweak list, you know. Oh, uh, really? Uh, the, the B flat needs to be an A flat. Yeah, he's very finicky about if you go too far with a harmony that's outside of what he or whoever it is that's in his office. I, I really didn't, don't know who's I'm sure it's not him. Story. Yeah. <laughs> it's not him. I no. think he's been too busy writing his autobiography. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> But in the case of John Williams, John Williams goes through every single score that is released with his name on it. And uh, he's very particular. And he'll you get your proofs back with little notes from him. Uh, he's a composer's composer. He cares about his work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yet they're all very logical. His comments, he, totally, oh, I get it. I want to do that. You know, Sometimes the ones that are going into – other places where you've got somebody that may or may not know that much about music. They've just got a checklist of things that they're looking for and who knows what. Right. <laughs> but that's rare. Most of the time stuff just, if they have a print right to it, it gets. Printed. It gets. Yeah. Okay. And I, you've just reminded me of a book. I'm pretty sure you wrote, I'm, I'm picturing it's kind of red and blue and it's about Bach. Uh, you, you've rearranged the classics in the style of someone right. else. I, I, uh, those, that, those are jazz arrangements, yeah. Yes, I, I'm. I, I, I've just suddenly realized another book of yours that I've enjoyed uh, exploring. So there you go. You've had, you've had a big I, impact. I loved. I loved that. That was fun doing. Mm. Was, although I, my wife says that uh, if I'm so fortunate to walk through the, the pearly gates, that the first thing I'm going to do is get clocked by by Bach. You know. <laughs> for, for, 
for messing around with his classics. You know? You, you know, I would I would think the opposite. He would be shaking your hand and congratulating you <laughs> because that's exactly what he loved doing, though, wasn't it? Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I yeah. think he'd support well, you in that. <laughs> so, can you give us just a, a quick glimpse? Um, and this is going to lead on to my next question about teaching arranging and some ideas around that. Can you give us a glimpse into how you actually go about arranging something? I'm wondering. Do you, obviously, once you start, once you've got the level you need to write for, is it about uh, the pattern or, or the feel? Like, is it going to be a habanera or is it going to be a jazz or is it something else? Well, what's the little process? When it's a folio, when you got 15 or 20 songs. There's a little bit of having to get a picture of the whole, you know, and all right, I can't, you know, if I'm going to do something in a Chopin-esque style for this, you know, I, I'll i save that for this song, you know, this song might fit into this sort of thing. So there's a little bit of that kind of juggling going on to make mm-hmm. sure the book fits together. And sometimes it's just luck. I mean, honestly, it's sitting down at the piano and fiddling around to me it i don't mean to oversimplify but i i really do to a lot of degrees i i go back to my head of when i was a kid wanting to play the piano and the things that were fun to do you remember the things that really got you excited and and try to say what is it about this what can i do with this song that would draw uh somebody into wanting to play it you know and and as you know as a piano sometimes it's it's a sound, but it's also sometimes the feel. Mm, definitely. The things that feel right under the hands that are fun to do. Um, so it's a combination of all those things. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it, it takes a bit of a big picture look at things, where everything fits in, and then you just you start playing the originals and sometimes things just emerge. Well, and I also pull – I have a, a, a lot of – I'm a crazy – you probably are too being – I, I, I buy – books way too much we we all do that yep and i (laughs) good to hear that even someone that creates them does that too (laughs) oh i do when i travel promoting my books i my wife calls it deficit travel Uh, (laughs) i I come back with more than i probably sold you know i just love piano music and i love well i love all types but and i'll just pull something off and play you know and try to get inspired by somebody else's stuff you know Mm. So have you got any tips now for teachers in encouraging their own students to arrange music or or even compose, I guess? I know that this subject gets bandied about a lot in in the teaching world. and, And I think the thing that you have to do, at least in my mind, is is be willing to stretch yourself beyond what you're comfortable with. I think sometimes we want to teach what we know we know. But a student that really wants to learn about thus and such, be willing to learn along with them. You know, you may don't, you may never have played this particular kind of music or know anything about it, but let's explore it together. You know, um, since composition and arranging is where I'm most comfortable, that's where, you know, that, that part is easier for me. But what might be harder is, you know, a student that wants to play, uh, you know, list that my technique, I'm like, I, this is, I don't have the hands to play this, but you do. And let me help you find a way to do it. I think arranging and composing comes out of playing lots of great literature. So keep, don't just teach the pieces you know, you know, find new things and if let them bring things to you too and, and play a lot of different styles. I, my biggest grumble about piano teaching is when we reduce things down to here's the list of stuff that, you know, that we will teach and we'll learn on the piano. When there's all this great stuff floating around uh, from currently and then, you know, 100 and 200 years ago, be adventurous. <laughs> That's great. And, and kids want to have that autonomy or, a, a, you know, a say in what goes on in their lessons now. You can't just direct them so much and that and just tell them what to do they want to have some say and i think that's only reasonable and as you say that brings in new material even if it's not amazing you're out of your comfort zone a little bit you're trying new things yeah and i think the only thing you do have to do is when they bring in they want to play something from frozen and they bring in the piano vocal edition of it that's unplayable right you do have to at times say this is going to maybe make you quit playing the piano (laughs) 
let's find a version that's at a level that you can be successful at. So sometimes you have to tweak that a bit, but. And, uh, and I'm more and more to teach students when it comes to pop music, teach students how to play the chords and encourage them to sing because ultimately that's what the music was designed for. And yeah. <laughs> so, you know, trying to play the uh, vocal line in your pinky and fourth finger while you're playing yeah. chords. I mean, it's, it's so difficult. Yeah. That's great. And um, what about for kids that bring in compositions of their own? I have a lot of teachers say, oh, this kid's just brought in this thing and it's, it's kind of clunky or, or maybe it's amazing. <laughs> but yeah. what, do I, what do I do to encourage them? <laughs> well, what I would say is sometimes, and this might, may sound strange coming from a, a, someone, you know, I have to write all this stuff down. Sometimes I think we get a little too hung up on making sure every I is dotted and T is crossed. Is, is, is there notation perfect at this point and get all wrapped up in that presentation. And I'm a little less concerned about that. You know, that will come, but what are the ideas and, 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 and how, you know, could this section is really good. Could you extend that? And I, I think sometimes they get really, really rooted down and, and lost and overwhelmed when they feel like they have to, be able to notate it perfectly too early in the process. Mm. That's one thing I would caution. Right. That. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, and it, it also takes a lot of time as a teacher to help a student to learn to notate or to correct notation and to help them with that. So I'd much prefer to be getting them composing more and creating more than focusing on that nitty gritty, at least at the start. I, I agree. Mm. Uh, and the only thing I do do is it, when they get older, I, I just had a student a couple of years ago that almost come in college level where had never actually written a note on a piece of paper, could, could make finale do anything. Right. And, I, is, you know, I'm really glad that you know how to work finale, but you need to learn how to get out a pad and write it so that you know why the slur line is where it is, you know, and not, you're not dependent on the program making all these decisions. For right. <laughs> That's that's a good question for you then. Do you tend to write uh, your music as you arrange or do you go straight to digital now? I, I go straight to to digital. Yep. Um, I wrote in pencil for years and years and years and years and years and I fought against it. <laughs> but, you know, once you're into that, once you start writing in, in a program, it, it, you can never go back. It, right. It's so much more, so, so much more efficient. Um, Hal Leonard takes... They, I send in my stuff done in finale, but they actually redo it all in Sibelius anyway, um, because they have their own typesetting specifications. Yeah. And stuff. yeah. If, any, if any of them are watching this now, they're going, uh, they're probably screaming. <laughs> They've been after me for years to switch to Sibelius because that's what they use. And, and, you know, I've been using finale since 1989 you know or no, no well i early 90s whatever too long i'm not going to switch at this point <laughs> fair enough um well look we'll start wrapping things up i've just got a couple more questions for you uh one is about teachers or university level students who would like to publish their own arrangements or be found by a publisher. I imagine that's getting really difficult these days it's probably like the rest of the music industry uh labels don't hand out contracts quite so much anymore i don't imagine have you got any tips for teachers or students that want to publish their own arrangements or compositions well if i were starting out now i would have a web page and i would be writing original stuff and putting it up there and, and making it available to, to people uh, just with my own self-publishing honestly and i think that that can lead to then if an arrangement with a publisher that, that acquires print rights. It's a waste of time. Well, I shouldn't say that. I think it is a waste of time chasing after print rights and saying, you want to do, I want to do beauty and the beast, you know, well, good luck with that. It's just, you know, it, the corporate publishing thing makes that almost impossible, you know? Mm. So write, write great stuff and then see, see where that leads you. And uh, I think it's exciting to be able to self publish like that. And, and I probably will do that at some point in the future when I'm not wanting to write as much and semi-retirement and I'm just write original stuff and put it on a, my site. Right. It's, that's where I would start. 
And we're lucky today that we have the ability to have websites, build them easily, freely, just about, and uh, post things on YouTube as well. So I, I, um, I think that's a great bit of um, advice. Yeah. All right, last question for you, Philip. Uh, what's the one big thing you'd like teachers to take away from today's interview? I, I think I would go back to what we said a little bit earlier, and that is to allow yourself to be pulled out of your comfort zone. Don't always teach the same method that you've always taught. Be open to doing a variety of different things. Uh, don't always take every student in the same direction where you know where the path leads. You know, we get, we get locked into these patterns, uh, but be open to, I'm not saying that the student is taking over your teaching, <laughs> <laughs> but, but follow that path, you know, that gets open for you through that student and, and, uh, I think the only thing that keeps life interesting is to keep learning. And I would encourage whatever, whatever your love is. Uh, my love is orchestral music. So I listen to orchestral scores and study them. Your love is piano literature. Don't quit studying piano literature. Listen and listen. And you pick up a, a book, a, a, a new collection of whatever, and find five different people playing it and see what the differences are between I think we don't spend enough time continuing our our learning and that's what makes it fun keep your keep it fresh for yourself well that's a fantastic note to finish on thank you so much Philip uh, where, where should people go to find out more about you and find your resources well everything piano wise for me at this point is at Hal Leonard okay that's, uh, my own my own website currently is uh, dark. I'm rebuilding it um, right now, which uh, is you mean dark fun. as it's not around or it looks black. Right. If if you go to <laughs> philipcavern.com right now, you'll see nothing. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, but in about six months, it will reappear, and uh, I, I'm going to try some experiments on there. That Fantastic. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing philipkeverin.com for uh, for people in a few months, uh, depending on when you listen yes. to this, of course. So that's going to be about midway or to towards the end of 2018. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, Philip. Uh, really appreciate it. And I know a lot of people have got lots out of what you've said. I appreciate it. Nice to meet you, Tim. Thanks so much. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that discussion as much as I did with Philip Keverin. What a uh, superstar of uh, the arranging and composing world. Uh, just fantastic to hear all that he has been um, producing and creating and will continue to do so in the future and great to hear some of his tips and strategies around the teaching side of things too. So a few reminders before I sign off. Firstly, we uh, released last week my preschool version of No Book Beginners. It was a really popular webinar. And uh, for those of you who joined us, thank you very much for, uh, for tuning in. Uh, and for those of you who missed it, then we have got a full course which breaks down No Book Beginners, which is my approach to teaching beginner students without any method books or reading for the first up to 10 weeks. We've got a full course that breaks that down for ages five and under, regardless of whether you're doing group or individual lessons, this all works for you as a part of my Inner Circle Piano Teaching Community. It's in our course academy, uh, along with all of our other courses uh, that are available there for our members. So if that is of interest to you, then the best way to access it is to head to timtopham.com slash community if you're not already a member. And uh, I'm also currently putting the finishing touches on my much anticipated garage band course. When we can easily spend $50 a month or more on paid apps for our studio, sometimes significantly more, this one is absolutely free. It's available on any Apple device and is incredibly clever and handy to have in your studio. But I know that a new technology like this can be a little bit overwhelming if you haven't tried it out before. So I'm actually laying out a 10 lesson video course, looking over my shoulder as I use this in the way that I teach with it. And it links in so, so well with my ideas around, for example, four chord composing. Uh, so more on that later this month when I go live with a free webinar. And of course, we will be releasing that whole course uh, as soon as it's available to our Inner Circle community. 
Remember also that if you have a spare five minutes and would be interested in leaving me a review either on iTunes or Facebook regarding any of the resources that I put out or the podcast, then I would really, really appreciate it. It does have an impact on how I rank in the stores, uh, the uh, the iTunes stores and, and on Facebook and things like that. So if you are getting value from this and you haven't done that already, please take a moment to do it. It really means a lot. You can find out exactly how and get all the links at timtopham.com slash review. Next week on the podcast, we're going to be taking care of business. If you've ever wondered which aspects of your studio business can have the biggest effect on your bottom line, we're going to dive into actual data and find out. Does having a clean professional invoice have an impact on the amount that you can charge? Does allowing parents to pay by check have a positive or negative impact? And if you find absences and makeups a nightmare, then definitely stay tuned because we found a way to allow you to totally take your hands off this aspect of scheduling. And what about providing a sign-up form directly online so that you can avoid any kind of manual paperwork for your new students? Well, if all of that sounds interesting, find out the solutions by tuning in at the same time and the same place next week. I'm Tim Topham, and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.